Lynn, thank you for the scripture reading. And I know God has been good to you. Let us pray. Father, indeed, time after time, we have waited on you. And now as we are about to enter your word, we are willing to wait again. Asking, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will come into this moment and speak to us. May it not be my words, ye Father, but your words. And may our hearts be ready to receive it, to apply it. And, O oh Father, change us. Lord, have your way now, we pray. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Now, yesterday, I was made aware of Ida Keeling. Yes, Ida Keeling was an American track and field athlete. Don't know if you know her. She has the record for the fastest time between the ages of 95 to 99 year old. Oh, you're happy, you're laughing. But she later set another record for those in the age group of 100 to 104. You see, she finished the 100 meter in one minute, 17.33 seconds. Yes, this powerful woman died at the age of 106 years old. She was a strong woman, all five feet, five inches strong. And she had the strength and the desire to compete and to complete what many can only dream of. So I start by asking you the question, what is strength? What is strength? According to the dictionary, strength is defined as a state of being strong, the capacity of for endurance is the power to resist, you may say toughness. Better yet, it's the degree of potency or the force as measured in number, strength. So Ida was surely tough, small, but tough. It's therefore interesting, interesting that the strongest things on earth are not always found in the largest packages. The strongest things on earth are not always found in the largest people you can think about. For instance, in nature, I found out that scientists recently discovered the newest record holder for strength. A limpset is a marine gastropod mollusk. In, in, in simple term, guys, it's a sea snail. You know a snail is not a very large animal. And I'm not talking about the snail, but they found out that the, the, the teeth of this snail is made of the strongest biological material ever known to man. But what's more interesting, to see the teeth you have to take a microscope to see it. Pretty small. You see, the previous record holder for small, but was small, but was visible to the eye. We know the spider, right? The suit that produces silk. We saw it with our naked eyes. And this silk was so strong, they can use it to make part of the bulletproof vest to stop a bullet. And so personally, before I learned about the limp set, before I knew yesterday about Ida, my personal favorite was the ant. Allow me to share some facts about this amazing insect that, that many of you may have known already. If you didn't know, allow me to inform you. If you see, if you look around carefully, you realize that ants seem to be everywhere. Probably because there are 35,000 different types of ants in this world. 60 different species right here in the United States. Ants are incredibly strong when compared to humans, and they can lift and carry loads up to 50 times, some people say probably up to 500 times their own body weight. They frequently will pick up another ant from their colony and give them a ride in their mandibles, and they don't seem really to bother in doing that. As a child, I watch ant work as a teen. The Akushi ants, we call them druggers back in Guyana. They would destroy, literally destroy your garden overnight. You can have tomatoes or whatever plant there, and you wake up next morning and they're leafless. 
I would see them carrying trunk, chunk of leaves in a row back to their colony. It's amazing how some of us today, from our own age group, from our own gender, our own families, Chris, even our own religion, find it hard to work together to be hospitable with each other, but yet this ant seemed to just take it cool. Occasionally, we all can do with a lift from a friend. This life can get stressful, Renee. This life can get really challenging and nasty and sometimes deadly. And it doesn't matter what stage of life you find yourself, we all can take a free lift now and then. On the job, when the work gets real heavy for you, Young people, if you're in school, when the pressure to perform is on, we all can take a little lift now and then. I'm talking about a kind word. I'm talking about a random act of kindness, a text of encouragement, you know, something to cheer you up, to lift your spirit. We all can do that now and then. You see, sharing brings with it a joy that enriches your life. Selfishness is like a stench that nobody wants to be around. Fact number two, I was surprised, and it's interesting to know that the ant, he has two stomachs, two chambers in his stomach. And this is unique because many animals, you know, have four chambers, like the cow, for example. You wonder why the cow is such a, a burly beast? Because he has a four-chamber stomach. He goes around, Amanda, just gobbling up grass everywhere he sees, gobbling up, and then he sits down in his own comfortable time and regurgitates it and just enjoys. He chews his cud. A selfish little guy, right? But the ant is different. He has a two-chamber stomach. One is for himself, Chris, and one he feeds others from. The ant will not regurgitate his stuff and eat it for himself. He shares that with others. Very interesting. One for him and one to feed others from. Imagine what this world would be like, for my friends, if every day of our lives we deliberately stuck up to feed someone, not just to give them some brought forward or some leftovers or a little here or there, but we deliberately stuck up proportionally enough to share with someone else. What this world would be like. You know, in Acts chapter 2 verse 45, that's how it was in the Bible. When the church grew and multiplied, everyone took what they had and they shared with each other proportionally. Sad to say that selfishness is the order of today. Many are just obsessed with grabbing more for themselves. And the Bible calls such a person a fool. We know the story of the, the, the man who had enough. He said, I'll break down my barn and, and say, soul, eat, drink, and be merry. He was called a fool. And so clearly this man was not using his brain. Fact number three about the ant. The ant also has the largest brain in proportion to its size. That is why Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, said in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, he says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be what? Wise. Go to the ant and be wise. Clearly, this ant has the big brain for something. He used it for something. Have you ever wondered, I don't know, have you ever wondered why the people who seem to be most educated have all the acronyms and the letters of the alphabet behind their names sometimes seems to make some of the weirdest, most bizarre situations and decisions in life? Clearly, they don't have the strength. They don't have power. They do not have willpower today. And so ants are incredibly... They are incredible little creatures. And even if we take the conservative measure, and that is to say that they are ten times stronger than they ought to be, and you try to apply it to your life, if you are 100 pounds, my friend, imagine you can pull around 1,000 pounds. They'll clearly call you the strongest man to ever live today. The Bible tells us to go and learn from the ant and be wise. The ant is strong. It uses its extra large brain. It shares its food proportionally with others. 
And I say to you that there cannot be an easier blueprint for how we today can receive power. From the end, here's what the Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 10. Ephesians 6 verse 10, if you have your Bibles, it says, finally, finally, my brethren. It means that when you take into consideration the whole matter, this is it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Finally, be strong. So study the end seems to indicate that its strength comes from loving its neighbors. Because without hesitating, he would pick up another ant and move around. Studying the ant seems to indicate that we have to have love for one another. Love your neighbors as ourselves. That means looking out for their interests. Carrying them when they're down, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Sharing what you have. Sharing your knowledge. Sharing your love. Sharing your provision. Access. Sharing you. And third, using your brain. Making wise decisions. That's why in Isaiah 1 verse 18, we notice, well, the Lord says what? Come now, let us. What do you use to reason? Your what? Your brains. Come now, let's reason together. God wants his people. We pride ourselves that we have the most highly developed brain. But yet sometimes we use it for the readers' things we can think about. Use your brain. So the theme for this year, I was reminded, is that ye shall receive power. So where did Ida get her power from, her strength from? She said, I, uh, I eat for health and not taste. Sound like a good lesson. Today, many of us are eating for taste and not for our health. We eat a lot of junk food, right? This woman, we're talking about you shall receive power. I'm going somewhere with this. She said, I ate for, for health and not for taste. She said, we exercise daily. So is this the only source of power and strength? Eating for health and not for taste. Exercising is not the only source for power and strength. Turn with me to the book of Judges. The book of Judges introduces us to the strongest man. Let's get to humans now. I talk about the ant, and the ant, we can learn from him. Well, let's get to some human beings. We're not insects. But the Bible says, learn from the ant. Well, let's go to some human being. We're, we're told in the book of Judges of the strongest man who ever lived. And his name was Samson. You know the guy. His life was filled with fascinating stories of defeating a lion in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. Oh, I wish I could do that, right? He catched 300 foxes. He killed 1,000 men with a fresh bone of a donkey's jawbone, right? Samson's story. Samson was incredibly strong, and looking over his life, his strength was not his own for sure. The book of Judges here brings us to Samson. And this is the case because Samson's strength did not come from within himself. The Bible says in Judges chapter 14, you can go to Judges chapter 14, verse 6. I'll read it in your hearing. Because I want you to meditate on this when you get home later on. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, how? Mightily. So God was the source of Samson's strength. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. We're talking about the theme for this year. You shall receive power. So we are introduced to Samson when he was about 20 years old. No one really knew his age for sure, but we know that uh, when we are introduced to Samson, after the, we give the story of how he was born, the next thing we hear is about Samson wanting a wife. And that's how Samson's life kind of started. We hear told that Samson wanted a wife. And eventually, Samson picked a fight with her country folks when things didn't go his way. And so we know that Samson had to be about 20 years old because... In Numbers chapter 1, verse 45, when David was numbering the people and so on, this is what we get. According to the Bible, in Numbers 1, 45, it says, and I read it in your hearing, So were all those who were numbered of the children of Israel, by the house of their fathers, from 20 years old and upward, 
all that were able to go out to war in Israel. So you couldn't go out to war in Israel if you were under 20 years of age. And so we're told that Samson wanted a wife. He went and he got a wife. When things didn't go his way, he picked a fight with the Philistines. So he had to be at least 20 years old. Tragically, he only ruled for 20 years before he died. So I asked the question, is there a correlation between Holy Spirit power, between strength, using your brain, sharing, fellowshipping, prayer, Certainly, there must be a correlation between these things. You see, I can recall my 20s. Oh, the good young days of being 20. Oh, lifting weights and feeling invincible. Uh, those days are long gone. I can tell you, I try, and I try, and I cry. <laughs> Trying to relive those days is just a figment of your imagination. The deceptive part of Samson's life is not that he died with the Philistines. It is not that he allowed the desire for love to take him down. It's not even the fact, Amanda, that he had the Spirit of the Lord with him. And that wasn't the deceptive part. Samson was smart. Samson clearly used his brain. Samson gave a riddle that no one knew the answer to. It didn't take a normal fool to do that. You had to be clever to come up with a riddle that no one else can answer. Samson was smart. Samson cared for others. How do I know that? Because he was a judge. He was a judge who believed in justice. He was fair. How do I know that? If he wasn't fair, the Bible would have made known of this because the same way the Bible talked about Eli's and Samuel's son who was corrupt, they would have mentioned that Samson was corrupt. This man was smart. He was fair. See, the lesson for us today as we study Samson is that he was greatly deceived. The word of God says, be not deceived, for God is not muck whatsoever a man sow, that is what he shall also reap. Samson's greatest deception is the fact that he felt that the Spirit was, was always and will always be with him. That was his greatest deception. I tell you for sure, you shall receive power. That's a promise. It is guaranteed. The power you receive will give you strength. The power is available for you today. The power is external. It doesn't come from within you. It comes from God. But sadly, some of us, like Samson, may be deceived about this power. So, the life of Samson is a clear reminder that every day of our lives, we must make our calling and election sure. We shall receive power, but we must stay connected, connected to the vine, connected to Jesus Christ. I'm quite certain if I ask each of you right now, almost every single one of you have a cell phone on you. And you know, let's say 80% of you have a cell phone on you, because someone just said no. <laughs> or let's say 50% of you have a cell phone on you. And you know that that cell phone is of no use if it doesn't have power, if it's not connected to the source of power. Otherwise than that, it's just a piece of metal walking around in your pocket. And so, my friends, who is this message for today? But most of Preachers will use a story to warn teenagers about the dangers of choosing the wrong partner. When I first heard this story, preachers were preaching about, do not be unequally yoked. We hear this story, and that can be true. It is true. However, today I believe that this message is for every single one of us, man or woman, folks who are in the church, and most importantly, for seasoned leaders of the church. We all need power. And this power is much more than just a physical thing. Much more than just strength. To be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might means today to still have confidence in him. 
to still believe that he can do what he said he will do in 2024. And so we all can benefit from the ability to resist, to be tough, to be strong, to endure, to run a race at 102 years old. We all can deal with that. So let's examine briefly the life of Samson. Please follow me in Judges 15. Because I don't want you to just go home and listen to my voice. I want you to, to marinate because I will bring some things from a different light that you may not have heard before. Judges 15 verse 19. I'll read in your hearing. It says, And God spit open the hallowed place that is at Lehi, and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, the name of it is called Enkahori. It is at Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now, we're not talking about a teenager. From this point of the story, Andre, we are talking about a leader of God's people. Samson is no longer a teenager. Samson is actively a judge. He's a leader of God's people. So from this point of the story, when I talk about Samson, do not imagine some little immature child running around the place. I'm talking about a spiritual leader of God's people. I'm talking about your elders. I'm talking about your pastor. I'm talking about all of us in, in authority to lead God's people. Samson, this leader had the Spirit of God in his life, and he was revived. Every day, the Spirit was with him. He had power. He had strength. It is no secret that Samson's victories had nothing to do with his muscles or his hair, his locks, that the story for the little children will portray. It has nothing to do with that. Had it been so, the Bible would have took the time to clearly describe him as such. Follow me now. We read of Goliath, man of stature, this big man. In 1 Samuel 17, the Bible took the time to describe Goliath. It says in 1 Samuel 17, Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, basically nine feet tall. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and his arm of, uh, he, he was armed with a coat of males, and the weight of this coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. The Bible took the time to describe Goliath and what he wore. All right, let me give you another example. You heard about Absalom's beauty and his hair. In 2 Samuel 14, verse 25, when you go home, you can check that as well. The Bible took the time. The Bible said, now in all of Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. Now, I feel like a piece of rubbish, right? Here's what the Bible says. It said, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, the Bible went down to more detail. The Bible says, well, for at the time, at the end of every year, he used to cut it. And when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekel by the king's standards. That's five and a half pounds. Now, I tell you, when I, when I shave off this little thing and I, and I put it on a scale, it doesn't even register. <laughs> and Samson... The Bible took the time to, uh, I mean, Absalom, the Bible took the time to describe this guy, a handsome dude, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his hair, and when he cut his hair, five and a half pounds. But when we get to Samson, there's crickets. There is no detail about his beauty, no detail about his size. And so we have to conclude that he had no, we have no detail about his biceps, triceps, quads, or traps, nothing. And so, we have to conclude that Samson was not a big, burly giant like Goliath. Not a big man. So, I know that for sure. Because why... If Samson was this big monster of a dude, why would 3,000 Israelites shake and quake and run away, be afraid, when 1,000 Philistines came to collect Samson? 
Think about it. The Bible says use your brain, all right? When Goliath challenged the train of Israel, who was shaking on the battlefield? Every one of Israel, including the king, because they had a monster of a man, Goliath, and they had some supporting armies. Now, if Samson was a monster of a man, when 1,000 Philistines show up, 3,000 Israelites would not have been quaking because they had who? The champion on their sides. On their side. You see, as little children, sometimes we read over these stories and they become so fanciful. God is trying to teach us a little more lesson here. And so it was the Israelites who were afraid of the Philistines when they had Goliath on their side. So clearly Samson did not look the part. Clearly he was different. And he had to be different in order to corral 300 foxes. It doesn't take a big, strong man to capture 300 foxes. Impossible. It takes a smart man to corral 300 foxes. And so, clearly his strength and the victories came from God. So what are some lessons? What's the lesson out there for me that uh, what can I learn that if I'm to receive power, the kind of power that Samson had, what must I do or not do in order to receive that same power? Your theme for this year is that ye shall receive what? Power. Lesson number one, for all members and leaders alike, we must remember that our success, I know we're beginning to experience some success, the church is growing, our success is not of our own making. It's not our smarts, it's not our connection, but in the presence and the power of God in our lives, that is what gives us power. To be strong in the Lord means to be grounded in God. To be steadfast in Him in 2024, regardless of what success we experience. So whether it be on the job, Young people, whether it be in school, wherever you find yourself, to be strong in the Lord will guarantee you receiving power. But too many of us, we are often quick and easy to believe that when we start to experience the power, hey, it got to be about me. Look at me. It's all about me, me, and me. And we lose, we let go of the anchor. Will that song say, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? We have an anchor that keeps the soul. We have to be steadfast in Jesus Christ. James 1.5 says, If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He will give you freely. Philippians 4.13 reminds us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So the, uh, our ability to receive power of the Holy Spirit rests in my willingness, your willingness, to let self decrease and God must increase. The more we are selfish, the more we are self-centered, the more we are self-righteous, we will not receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The power that rests upon Jesus, the power that Jesus had in human form when he walked this earth, was there because he was willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done. A surrender to the Father, a surrender to God. And that's why we encourage to esteem others better than ourselves. We are encouraged to seek the interests of others. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This church will continue to grow if we are willing not to elevate self, but to elevate Jesus Christ. Lesson number two. What, as a leader, I can learn. What, as a leader, you should learn. What, as human beings, you can learn. Two is better than one. What's lesson number two? Two is... Better than one. You see, in Genesis, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Adam was. God decided one is not good enough for every need. Two. Two is better than one. Some say it is when Eve was removed from Adam that she found herself in a whole lot of trouble. Well, follow me now in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Turn me to it. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We read verses 9 and 11. The book of Ecclesiastes written by the wisest man, chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. 
Here's what it says. One is better than two. Oh, so someone, someone is ready. Are you there? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 11. Maybe it can be put up on the screen as will help some of you. It says what? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will what? Lift up his fellow. But woe, is that a good thing? But woe, is that a good thing? No, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they shall keep what? Warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will what? Withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You see, in the ministry of Jesus, he sent his disciples out two by two. Not a coincidence. In the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was praying, he wanted his disciples to what? Watch and pray with him. Because two is better than one. The, 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 the spirit of prophecy tells you that after the disciples were just sleeping, angels came and what? Ministered to him because two is better than one. We can do many things alone, but it's often better when you have company. It's satisfying. Why am I saying that? Salvation without your loved ones, is that satisfying? Do you want to be in heaven alone? Sila. The Bible says, think on these things. Do you want to be in heaven alone? The power that rests upon Moses, you shall receive power. Moses certainly had power. The power that rests upon him was evident in Moses' desire not to enter the promised land or heaven alone. Here's what it says in Exodus 32, 32. Moses requested this. Moses and God having a conversation. Moses says, forgive them of their sins. Talking to the children of Israel. Forgive them of their sins. But if not, blot me out. Blot me out of the book that you have written. Moses saying, hey, I want to go. I want to cross over. But I want Amanda to come with me. I want Chris to come with me. I want You understand? And if they can't come, I don't want to be there. What humility, what love. Understand, my friends. We shall receive power when our desire to see others succeed. We shall receive power, leaders, when our desire to see others gain salvation is far more it exceeds than our own desire to be saved. Because that's what Jesus did. Not esteeming, the scripture says, being equal with God or something to, to, be, to grasp on. But he gave up that. He condescended. He came down to die on the cross so that I can be there. So you shall receive power when your desire for humanity exceeds your own desire to get in heaven. It's not about me alone. Well, well at least I am there. Too bad for those on the outside. You shall receive power. Samson needed company to complete his mission. And his desire for company while doing the Lord's work impacted his mission and his ministry. Friends, as you go about trying to fulfill your mission and your ministry, recognize that putting others first requires some serious guidance and teamwork. The Father gives the Son, the Son gives the Spirit, and we know the gift goes on and on. They place humanity, the interest of humanity, saving soul front and center. Without a team, we run the risk of working in isolation and possible destruction. Some companionship can save our lives, and we know for sure, however, that some companionship can take us down. So advancing the work of Stafford in 2024 will require some amazing teamwork. It's not up to Chris alone. It's not up to your elders alone. It's not up to your leaders alone. It'll take some teamwork, my friends. Paul needed Barnabas. Paul needed Silas and Timothy later on in his life. Peter needed John. So I ask the question, who do you need in your life today? Whoever you think you need, ask God to show you the right person or the people who can help you fulfill your purpose and your mission in life. 
Ask God to lead you to the right people who will help you share this message of a soon coming Savior with a world that desperately needs this good news. But I love 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. It says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed lest he fall. You see, it's so common for many of us today to think that we can do things all alone. We don't need help from anyone. This is a trap, my friends. We all need someone. Your Christian walk may not be what it is today if it weren't for some important people in your life. I don't know if some people will tell you maybe it was my grandma or my, my aunt or her sister. Some of us are only here today because someone invested in our lives. I thank God for godly friends. I thank God for friends who want to live a life of integrity and purity. Today, God can help you find such a friend if you just ask for him. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us that the thought that God has towards us is not one to destroy us. They're taught to give us a future and a hope. It is the enemy who is walking wrong as a roaring lion seeking to devour us. And so, if we desire to start a ministry, get God involved. If we desire to do a great work, get God involved. Young people, if you want to get better grades where you are, ask God for wisdom. Trust him. Study hard. And he certainly will bless you. And so point number three, one more point after this, recognize and accept God's grace. Recognize and accept God's grace. You see, many of us, as we listen to the life of Samson, we think as though verse chapter 16 happened in isolation at some weird time of his life. Turn with me quickly to chapter 16 as I read verses 1 to 6. It says in chapter 16, Samson went to Gaza. And there he saw a prostitute. And he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night saying, let us wait till what? The light of the morning and we will do what? Kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bars and all, and put them on his shoulder and carried them to the top of the hill that is the front of Hebron. Here's how it ends. It says, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. I know many of us heard this story over and over. But let me challenge you now. Let's look at a few phrases. It says, at the gate. Some of you must, must have heard this phrase before. At the gate. You see, at the gate is a place where decisions are made. At the gate is where the, lead, the leaders of the village would meet. Samson took up all the gates, the bars, and the doors. When we read the Bible sometimes, we read things literally, and we think everything is out of it. But the Word of God said that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction of righteousness, so that the man of God will be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when I read that at the gate, Samson took up the gates, the doorposts, and everything. I had to realize that God is trying to tell me something much more than just what meets the eye. It means that Samson, at that point of his life, was making all the decisions. Hebron. We know the story of Hebron. Hebron was what Joshua received as an allotment he gifted to Caleb. Hebron was the reward that Caleb received for faithful service and loyalty. Hebron became a city of refuge. Here in the story, Samson, in a place, Hebron, where, which represents refuge or safety from sin and destruction. Because when you have been a man slayer, last week, Pastor Chris talked about the difference between man slain or manslaughter and murder. 
Hebron, city of refuge, a place that you, he got from faithful service. Samson, at that junction of his life, is saying, in the face of God, where I should be merciful and concerned for my sin, you know what, God? I got this. I'm going to make, as of now, I'm making all the decisions. Very important. You see, Samson was a man of God. And as a judge of Israel, he was living a double life. Today's message is for us as leaders. Samson was living a double life. He was judged by day and a prostitute seeking, let me keep it PG, prostitute seeking sinner at night. Judged by day, sinner by night. And maybe, understand, the world knew his secret. Because the scripture clearly says that the people of Gaza had heard that Samson was in town. The people knew his secret. Maybe the church folks don't know your secret, but trust me, the world knows your secret. There might be someone sitting here today watching this message later on on YouTube or wherever, and you will feel that because the folks next to me don't really know my secret, then I am good. But understand, Numbers 32, 32 says, Be sure your sins will find you out. The story of the gate is much more about, uh, more than Sam's, about Samson's strength. But the story of the gates is a marking of a very significant change in Samson's life. What was the change? In Judges 14, verse 4, Samson did something questionable. Samson said, get her for me, for she what? Pleases me well. Samson picked a woman in his life that uh, his father was, was perplexed. He's like, isn't there another Christian girl in the town that you can take? But according to the Bible, in Judges 14, 4, it says, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. So at that point in his life, God was calling the shots. By the time we get down now to Judges 16, when Samson, when the story says he took up the doors, and Samson saying, all right, God, take a back seat. I got this. I am calling the shots. Understand, to be strong in the Lord is to wait upon the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, They that what? Wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall have renewed strength. We're talking about you shall receive power. For you to receive power, leaders, elders, men, women, boy and girl, you have to wait upon the Lord. You can't run ahead of him like Samson. You can't say, God, take a back seat. I got this now. Let me do me. You have to wait upon the Lord. And that's why Proverbs 3, 5 says what? Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. And you know, your own understanding. In all your ways, what? No, you tell God, to take a back seat. God, I got this one. No, in all your ways, let him lead you. Acknowledge him and ye shall receive power. So in 2024, if you want to receive power, don't run ahead of the Spirit. Don't run ahead of God. Let him still make decisions for you. Don't put him in the back seat. He's not your toddler. He is your leader. He is your savior, your king. And so Samson had the spirit with him, yet he was meddling in sin. He was leading God's people while embracing sin. He didn't recognize and accept God's grace. Like many of us today, we have become openly defiant and hardened our sin because we fail to understand, we fail to appreciate, and at times even recognize God's grace. So the lesson for me, I don't know about you, the lesson for us is that the longer we partake in sin, the farther we push the spirit away. The harder it is for us to recognize grace. You know, my family have a dangerous way of sometimes driving the car in E. They tell themselves that as long as they start the engine and the car moves, eh, E doesn't really matter. Check engine light comes on, eh, I think, uh, the, I mean, the light, gas light comes on, eh, they say you have something in the reserve, so I can keep pushing it, pushing the limit. My friends, we need to thank God for grace. 
Grace and is greater than all my sin. Grace is greater than all my shame. I don't know who I'm speaking to today. But you might be involved in some activity that you should not be involved in. But because you believe, you believe that because I've been getting away with it so long, I can keep pushing the envelope. I can keep pushing the limits. Leaders along, leaders alike. Sometimes because we keep getting away with things, we think it's okay. We can push the limit a little further. Friends, today, today is that chance to make a change. The Word of God says today, if you hear my voice, what? Harden not your heart, and you shall receive power. Power over sin, power over failure, power over temptation, power over condemnation, power over to, to, to deliver, power to succeed in places in your life where you have been receiving just failures and misery all the time. For those of us old enough, we can remember a man named Elliot Spitzer. This man was a popular man in New York. Sure picked to be governor. Uh, became governor. Uh, Elliot Spitzer was crusading against human trafficking by day. Serious man. Crusading against human trafficking. To make a long story short, while he was crusading against human trafficking during the day, he was patronizing prostitutes at night. Until his story became public news and he had to resign and step down. He told Governor Patterson, I want you on my team. Stay out of trouble. Patterson, stay out of trouble. But he was not staying out of trouble himself. He was not even following his own advice. He was living a double life until his life came crashing down. Be sure your sins will find you out. In the Bible, King Saul crusaded against witches. We know the story. Saul crusaded against witches until by night he too went to see a witch. What happened? He lost his kingdom. He lost his life. Be sure your sins will find you out. And so my final point before I take my seat. We shall receive power when we learn to number our days. Moses in Psalms 90 learned this lesson that life is short. We try to sustain it with all kinds of vision of yesteryears. And we try to keep the momentum going just to find it is difficult. And that's why they say to you that it's a midlife crisis. Because once you meet a certain age, it's hard to try and turn the clock back. Life, it is what it is. Understand, the things are not always promised to us. Samson's short life of about 40 years or more. This man of God thought that maybe life was ahead of him and he got it made. He can do, then realizing that things would be different. So what can I read in Judges chapter 16, verse 20? It says, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as in other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had what? Left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shekels. Let me examine this passage, these passages again. Point number one. Observe number one. It says Samson was what? Asleep. Samson was asleep. And I know we read that over as though it's just another thing. Oh, Samson was sleeping. But understand, Jesus said of a friend, Jesus said, Lazarus was what? Sleeping. But Lazarus was as dead as a doornail. And so when I hear Samson was asleep, Samson, this man of God, was literally a walking dead. Or let's change it away. He was a dead man walking. He was alive and didn't know he was dead because he was in a place that only, look at the story again, Lazarus, who was dead, was in a place beyond the reach of humanity, but not out of the reach of God. He was in a place that only Jesus can rescue him from. So when I hear that, that, that Samson was asleep, it tells me that Samson was in a place of sin that only the mercy of God could reach him and deliver him from. He was a man of God, laying up in a prostitute house day after day. Imagine if I am your leader, and I come to church, and you see me every day, and I'm talking to you on that. But behind the scenes, man, my life is messed up and nasty. It takes the power of God to save me. Because it means that I'm so 
comfortable in my deception. I can come before you putting on a nice face, but comfortable in my sin. Asleep. Dead man walking, didn't even know it. Point number two that you probably missed. He said, I will get up and shake myself as in what? Other times. Mercy, Lord. Other times. Brothers and sisters, if you're to receive power, yesterday's blessings is for yesterday. Today's blessing, you got to get that afresh and anew. If any man desire to follow me, let him what? Deny himself. Take up yesterday's blessing. Take up his cross. How? Daily and follow me. Samson was running off of yesterday's power. He's like, I will get up and shake myself as in others' time, you know? How many of us are oblivious to the fact that we're no longer connected to God, but we believe that because I was a good guy yesterday, last month, last week, last year, that me and God are good. Shook himself as in other times, he says. I have students at school who sometimes fall into the trap. They never studied before in their lives. I'm going to time for a test. They believe I can get up. <laughs> and I'll do my thing like in other time. I'll just show up, and take the test, and get an A. But you know how that story will end, right? They're often disappointed. And if they don't pull themselves together, they're crushed and they feel hopeless. Einstein says insanity is what? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. That's craziness. The same is true with our salvation. We may have the Spirit of God today. We may receive power today. Grace is offered for us today. But the Spirit of God will not always thrive with us. One day we'll wake up in our self-righteousness. One day we'll try and shake ourselves at another time and then realize like Samson that we are lost. Another thing he said, I will shake myself. The Hebrew word shake, na'er, used to represent the shaking off of dust. I don't know if Samson was even recognizing what he was saying. Remember David when, 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 when Nathan said, uh, this is a story. And David said, who is the man? I will kill you. Nathan said, thou art the man. He pronounced judgment upon himself without even really, really realizing. Samson is saying, I will get up and shake myself. Be careful before you shake yourself out of God's grace. I will shake myself. He saw himself like a lion. The lion normally shakes his mane before he roars. Man of power and authority. Some of us are accustomed to getting up and we bark some advice and some instructions and people just flee and do whatever we say when we're empty on the inside. The question is, how many of us are just shaking ourselves without the Spirit of God? Going through the motion, faking it. The Bible has names for such predicament. In 1 Corinthians 13, it is called, you are a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You're an annoyance, you're a nuisance. Oh, 2 Timothy 3.5 is labeled that as having a form of godliness with no power. I'm glad that unlike Jonah, we know how Samson's life ended. It says a bronze shackle. When I heard about a bronze shackle, I smiled. I was happy for Samson. Because it tells me that even though a bronze shackle was used for fallen kings, because in Jeremiah, we know of King Hezekiah, he was taken away in bronze shackle. He was led away in shackles until he died. It tells me, therefore, that there is hope for Samson, bronze shackle. Why? Because a certain man whose name was Nebuchadnezzar, when because of his pride and arrogance, he said, isn't this the great Babylon I have built when God was pleading with him to change his ways? Nebuchadnezzar had a vision and he saw himself as a tree cut down on a stump left with a bronze ring around it. Bronze represent God's judgment of justice, but it was mingled with grace and mercy. He doesn't want us to utterly see us destroy. Even when he's trying to discipline us, he's still leaving some grace and mercy for us to find our way back to him. So had the story said, 
that they bound him in irons and led him away, we've known that his end was sure. We serve a merciful God, a God that is full of grace and mercy. So lead us as we lead. Let us pray that we are leading with the Spirit and we're not shaking ourselves. Friends, as you live your life today, don't try to put God in the backseat. Surrender to Him. He wants control of your life. Don't just go about shaking yourself. Proverbs 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness is what exalts a nation, but sin is reproach to every people. You might be strong today, but sufficient for today is the evil thereof. Sufficient for today, the power that God has given you is for today. Tomorrow, you need a fresh anointing. You need a fresh outpouring upon His Spirit upon your life. So today, if you desire to receive that power, why not invite Jesus into your life today? He has promised His Spirit that He will give you power. Power not known to man, power not, not in physical muscle, but power to trust in him. And he will do amazing things in your life. My friends, this power, you can't buy it on Amazon. You can't prime it. You can't AI generate it. This power comes from standing on the word of God and a willingness to believe in him even in 2024. So as I close, lead us. I encourage you to stand in the promise of God. Stop relying upon self because you see yourself as special. Rely upon the word of God in 2024. Be strong in the Lord. Strong, not physical muscle, but a result in, you have a resolve, a permanent decision to become what may. I will trust in God. If that's your decision, why don't you stand as we pray? If you want to say today, God, I'm tired of shaking myself. I'm tired of just doing me, trusting in me. I want to rely upon you. I want to stand upon your word. Father, you see the decision of your people. We're tired of being self-righteous. We're tired of just doing our own thing, walking around with fumes. We desire a strong connection with you. So that you can use us as willing instruments to be instruments of power. Make, to make difference not only in our lives, but in the lives of people. Because we do not want to enter heaven alone. You showed by your example, O oh Father, that you're willing to give up everything just to be with us. Oh Lord, give us that same desire so that we can have a burning desire to see humanity save. Oh Lord, surrender our hearts. You know of every sin that we have, secret sin, hidden sin, nothing is hidden from you. Forgive us and cleanse us, we pray. In Jesus' most holy name, amen and amen. Maybe seated for the offering.